Hello everybody, and as you can see, the 5 minute guides are not the only thing that's got a little bit of a workover and a new intro. So, with that out of the way, let's get on with those questions. Tamenga88 asks, why were the British the only ones that scrapped capital ships in compliance with the London Naval Treaty of 1930? I haven't seen the US or Japan scrap capital ships post-1930, but why did the British, considering they scrapped HMS Tiger and most of the Iron Dukes? The answer to this is actually different for each navy. So the Japanese, by the time the Washington Naval Treaty was said and done, basically already had their ten capital ships. They had the four Congos, the two Fusos, the two Iseis, and the two Nagatos under construction. So they had their ten, and everything else was hopelessly obsolete anyway. They had one of the Koachis left, which was of marginal value, and all of those, and the pre-dreadnoughts, etc., had all gone by the mid-1920s. So when the London, London Naval Treaty rolled around, there wasn't anything left for them to scrap, uh, basically. With the Americans, they did scrap some ships, it's just not as well known. Now, although the Delaware had gone to the scrapyard in the mid-20s, the North Dakota had been converted into a training and target ship in the mid-1920s. Uh, the Florida class, that's Florida and Utah, was still around, as were Wyoming and Arkansas. Now, obviously, these as 12-inch gunships were somewhat less useful than the 13.5-inch gunships of the Royal Navy. Nevertheless, North Dakota was scrapped in 1931 in accordance with the London Naval Treaty. Uh, so was Florida. Utah became a target ship replacing North Dakota and ended up being sunk at Pearl Harbor, but in a de obviously in a demilitarized state. And the Wyoming became a training ship as well in the London Naval Treaty, so it was also no longer combat capable, which left the Arkansas as the sole surviving 12-inch gun battleship of the United States Navy going into World War II. Simon asks a three-part question. He says, watching the video about Bismarck, I got the impression you don't think that turtleback armour used on the Bismarck was a good design choice, but why? Uh, he also says, does dove having a double rudder provide you with any benefits over having just a single one? And why did the British choose to mount only two propellers on the Nelson class and not four, like on some other contemporary designs? So, going in reverse order, as is now traditional, the Nelson class used two propellers because of their design legacy. They were a mixture of concepts from the G3 and N3 class battleships and battlecruisers. The N3s had only had two propeller shafts, and when it came to scaling it down, despite the fact that all previous British battleships had had considerably more than two shafts, and British battleships afterwards also would, the simple fact of the matter was they were trying desperately to squeeze as much of the advanced features from the N3s and G3s into a 35,000 tonne hull, and so it was thought better to just have two sets of propeller shafts and two larger propellers than the increased weight that would result from having four sets of shafts and four propellers, even though there were other efficiency advantages to having four shafts. Um, it was basically a case of absolute maximum weight reduction possible. Double rudder benefits over a single one. Yep, there are two primary ones, one of which as might be fairly easy to extrapolate is the fact that we're with two rudders if you for whatever reason whether through enemy action poor maintenance or the sea happen to have one of them destroyed disabled or jammed then you still have another functioning rudder which uh, obviously means that you can still maneuver to a certain degree and the second part of it is that you can do one of two things with the double rudder versus a single which is either you have two rudders the same size as your single, in which case you end up being able to manoeuvre the ship a lot better because you are um, redirecting twice as much water, or you can have the same surface area as your single rudder, but each of your individual doubles uh, are smaller, which means you affect the ship's draft a lot less, which means that obviously your ship can then assuming that the rudder was a major, one of the major issues, can then transit through shallower water. So, yeah, those are the main advantages of a double versus a single rudder. Obviously, the disadvantage is twice the maintenance and twice the things to go wrong. Uh, 
And finally, with the turtle back armor, no, I don't think it was a particularly good design choice, and uh, I will go into that in more detail in a special video at some point, but to very briefly uh, state why, as those of you who have watched a number of my videos uh, that relate to this particular design will have already said, uh, will already have noticed me saying, the Bismarck's biggest fatal design flaw was placing its fire control system communication cables above the armored deck and this was down to the fact they used the turtle back because the turtle back was mounted lower in the ship and that meant there just wasn't the space under that armor to fit everything and so they decided to put those cables above and that meant it basically was very easy to knock out the Bismarck's ability to meaningfully fire back um, even with hits that didn't actually breach any of the major armor, whether that's belt or deck. There are other factors as well, which I say I'll go into another time, but effectively that, that to me is the single biggest flaw of the use of the turtleback on the Bismarck design, it was simply the fact that the armored deck is supposed to be there as part of your, a comprehensive armor system to defend all the vital parts of your ship, and your fire control communications are a very vital part of your ship because that's what allows you to actually fight back and if your armor system means you can't fit those underneath it your armor system is inadequate and you should really look at a different one sir liv also has a three-part question first of which is hms hood officially considered a battle cruiser or an experimental fast battleship uh, second he references anthony preston's world worst world's worst warships and ask my opinion on it. And third, why do you think HMS Vanguard was not chosen to be modelled in World of Warships? Well, fate seems to be smiling on us because Vanguard, as of the date of recording today, <laughs> has actually just been released into World of Warships, um, as a premium, of course. Um, as to why they didn't model it in the game itself, considering how it matches up versus against something like the Monarch, which is probably where it would sit otherwise. Um, money, probably. Um, that, and they probably were a little bit unsure about exactly how to stat it up in the game, given its rather protracted and radical changes in development. As far as Anthony Preston and World's Worst Warships, I haven't read it, so I will withhold comment on that until I have. And as for Hood being either a battlecruiser or a fast battleship, I have discussed this in other videos, um, but just to briefly recap here, the British always designated it as a battlecruiser, but that's because the British designated anything capable of 25 knots or more in the capital ship range as a battlecruiser, and yes, that includes the Vanguard. Um, it was apparently at one point titled a fully armoured battlecruiser, which is just being really pedantic. As for the way I would classify it, I would personally classify it as a fast battleship, and that's for two main reasons, one of which is that Hood was so far divorced from the original battle cruiser mission, which was to fight and kill enemy cruisers, that it really doesn't fit that uh, original role anymore. And secondly, because if you look at any previous battle cruiser, so including things like the Lion and the Tiger and the Queen Mary in British hands, and even things like Der Flinger, Lutzow and Hindenburg in German hands, those ships all had lesser numbers of guns and less thick armor compared to their battleship contemporaries. Now Hood obviously didn't have a direct battleship contemporary because they weren't building any battleships simultaneously, but the most proximate battleship designs were the Queen Elizabeth and Revenge classes, and when you compare that with the Hood, the Hood has identical main armament, eight twin 15-inch guns, uh, sorry, eight 15-inch guns in twin turrets, I should say, um, and its armor belt, although by pure thickness is slightly thinner because of its inclination it is just as effective as the 13.5 inch belt on a queen elizabeth or a revenge and so therefore since it is as heavily armed and as heavily armored as a contemporary battleship it's just a lot faster i believe it merits the moniker of fast battleship 99 iron duke says what might have been the effect of a continued Anglo-Japanese naval alliance into the 1930s? In one short sentence, economic ruin and then war, or possibly war followed by economic ruin. Um, that might sound a little bit radical, but 
the end of the Anglo-Japanese Naval Alliance was one of the preconditions to the Washington Naval Treaty. So if the British Empire and the Japanese Empire decide to carry their alliance through into through the 1920s and into the 1930s, then that almost certainly means no Washington Naval Treaty, because whilst the Americans were prepared to accept parity with the Royal Navy in terms of numbers, as long as the Royal Navy had no direct allies, they weren't dumb enough to say, OK, well, we'll have 15 ships, you have 15 ships, and the Japanese can have 10, if they knew that the British and the Japanese could just immediately club together and go, aha, well, we have a combined fleet of 25, so you're going to do what we say. Um, American foreign policy may be somewhat disjointed at times, but they're not usually that stupid. Um, and the other only, only other option, of course, would have been for America to claim a fleet that was big enough to take on the British and the Japanese at the same time. So let's say 25 capital ships versus uh, 15 British and 10 Japanese. And there's absolutely no way in hell the British would have agreed to that. Uh, the Japanese probably almost equally as vehemently. And the sum total of that basically means, as I said, no Washington Naval Treaty and given that tensions between Britain and America were ramping up already in the 1920s, tensions between Britain and America when Britain has Japan on its side as well and is forcing the Americans to split their naval commitments across two oceans, I can only see that going very badly. Devo037 asks, I'd be interested in your opinion of how a battle-hardened ship and crew of the Leander-class HMAS Sydney managed to fall prey to a camouflaged German raider. Uh, lucky, lucky salvo, complacency, or conspiracy? Do, 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 do. So, basically, it's a mixture of design and sheer luck to be honest i mean the germans did a fantastic job of pretending not to be a raider which is what lured the sydney so close um there may have been a little bit of complacency in that they probably shouldn't have got to such point blank range anyway um but obviously we'll never know exactly why they did that um but the design part and the luck part are far more important design part because obviously the leanders were designed as um effectively commerce protection cruisers they weren't anywhere near as uh, heavily built as large or as well protected as uh, the town class that would follow them on uh, which made them obviously much more vulnerable to close range firepower and that in turn allowed the lucky hits that the Germans scored to actually do significant damage so it was a case of uh, good gunnery and luck by the Germans in actually landing their hits on the correct targets uh, in such a way that the Sydney was crippled very quickly, combined with a design that meant that when those hits actually arrived, the Sydney's armour and protective systems weren't able to resist the incoming fire. Um, I do believe the HMAS Sydney is due for its own five-minute guide, so I won't go any further than that there, because otherwise I'll just end up repeating myself. Old Contemptible asks, uh, considering how within roughly 10 years of the end of World War II, many formerly Axis nations were heavily rebuilt economically and militarily, with large portions of their military reinstated, was it ever considered to give, sell or loan them a substantial portion of the World War II surplus shipping? If so, how much, if any, of the Axis produced equipment would have been reinstated? Yes and no. Um, no one was particularly keen to give Japan or Germany battleships or anything like that in the immediate aftermath of World War II, um, in part because these things are much greater status symbols than tanks and artillery and even fighter jets. So well, they weren't particularly keen on that. But they obviously did get some equipment, mainly from the United States, because the United States had tons of surplus that it didn't really know what else to do with. Access produced equipment, no, they didn't really reinstate much of that, partly because, well, especially with the Japanese, there basically wasn't much left that was in any way, shape or form um, usable. Pretty much all their modern stuff had been sunk and anything that was left was hopelessly obsolete, especially after 10 years of technological progress after World War II. Um, and the Germans 
to be honest, weren't much better. I mean, maybe they could have made use of a refitted Prince Eugen if the Americans hadn't irradiated it to hell and back um, in an atomic bomb test. But really, they were better off with ex-American equipment because um, both Japan, Germany, and to a certain extent Italy had all suffered from effectively just not being able to complete much, if anything, new during the Second World War, um, whereas the British had not had that much of a problem and the Americans definitely hadn't had that much of a problem so it was a case of well do you want old worn out equipment back that's probably now two decades out of date and you'll need to heavily refit or do you want this shiny new ex-American ship which is all singing all dancing up to date and more more importantly has commonality of parts with um with, with the rest of NATO uh, which is also being likewise heavily rearmed. Uh, the Germans did keep some of their smaller lighter craft around for a bit, um, but they fairly rapidly replaced them. Gottjäger asks, what would a 1980s modernization of the King George V look like had they been kept in reserve like the Iowa class? To be honest, I don't think uh, they would have been uh, if the British were going to keep anything in reserve, it would have been Vanguard. They did keep the King George V in the NATO fleet commitments for a while, um, but realistically, they would have kept Vanguard into the 1980s and scrapped the King George V, if at all they could. Um, however, the NATO agreements initially did hold them to keep a number of battleships in reserve, so I guess we could, in theory, say that those strictures were never relaxed and maybe they felt compelled to do so for some reason so in that view the king george the fifths obviously are much smaller than the iowas and they would have received a lot more hardware because they were in service for longer um during world war ii so i suspect you probably wouldn't have seen them being reactivated so much uh, maybe you would have seen them in service for the korean war um definitely obviously not for the vietnam war because the uk didn't get involved in that um, an early 1980s modernization would have been hilariously on point because that would have possibly led to the uh, rather amusing thought of a whole squadron of battleships leading the Royal Navy south to retake the Falklands, which I'm actually, to be fair, if, if the British had started reactivating the King George of this, I'm not necessarily sure the Argentinians would have dared try retaking the Falklands in the first place, but there you go. So, obviously they would have lost all their light AA, like the Iowas did, but given that the design would have been a lot more confined than the Iowas because due to their lower displacement, um, I think probably you would have seen them, at least if I, if I was had anything to do with it, um, I would have removed the forward super-firing 14-inch turret and uh, the associated armor and maybe replaced that with a surface to air missile battery uh, because after all you've got the barbette you've got the magazines all there ready to go you might as well um, so that probably would have been um, sea dart i'm imagining so yeah probably multiple sea dart launchers um, on where the uh, twin 14 inch has gone i probably would also take out the super firing 5.25 inch turrets and either put goalkeeper ciws on them or possibly one goalkeeper ciws per side and one seawolf short range missile defense unit each side um, again exploit the fact you've got the barbettes etc built in and just take off the heavy turrets replace them with those launchers um, i think the lower 5.25s would probably come in useful for bombardment and self-defense the location of the aircraft hangar is unfortunately really in the wrong place to try flying helicopters from, so maybe you would have actually had four goalkeeper CIWS in place of the four upper 5.25s and then had a Seawolf battery where the aircraft hangar would have been. Lord Oceanus asks, as a modification of the three Wichita question, this was uh, three Wichita's versus Graf Spey, um, Wichita and both St. Louis class ships, all three are faster than Graf Spey, and if the St. Louis got into a broadside, they have 15 6-inch guns. So just to be clear, we're talking about the modified um, design of the Brooklyn class, not the uh, early 1900s <laughs> armoured cruisers. Um, but basically still, it's it's not doesn't really change anything it the graf Bay still loses um wichita is a significantly more combat capable ship than the exeter was 
and the St. Louis class are significantly more combat capable than the Leander class, so effectively you're talking about one heavy and two light, which is a uh, fight that the Graf Spee just about lost, except now that all three ships have got massive upgrade, so yeah, same difference, Graf Spee still loses that one. And on to the Discord questions, Matt Jade asks about a possible alternate scenario where Yamamoto takes over as naval minister and directs the Japanese Navy more towards carriers. So in this scenario, he wants to take uh, Zuiho, Shoho, Nishin, Mizuho, Chitose and Chiyoda, all being converted to light carriers before the war starts. His question is, when... Um, is to shed more light on the shadow carrier program. It sounds really ominous, but that's just what the Japanese called uh, their light carrier program. Um, what started it, and were they as successful as United States light carriers? So they weren't as successful as the US light carriers, and that was basically down to what they were made of. The US light carriers, um, mostly things like the Independence class, although they were taken from other ships, in obviously in that particular case a Cleveland-class cruiser hull, they were designed to take the hull and turn it into a full-fledged carrier, and as a result they had certain efficiencies sort of halfway between um, a full-fledged carrier and a sort of a bit of a bodge job conversion. They also had the advantage of just being manufactured in large numbers, so all the US light carriers were part of large classes so they could refine the design as it went on and there was a certain commonality of equipment and of course the hulls themselves were designed for high speed operations anyway whereas the Japanese program used a whole bunch of different odds and ends uh, taken from all over the place so they had different power plants different top speeds different sizes each one was very much a bit of a custom job and so they took longer and their load of planes varied quite significantly as well. There was also the fact that a lot of them being built on merchant hulls, they just weren't anywhere near as survivable as something that had been built on a hull that had always been intended for military use. As for what started it, it was basically a recognition by the Japanese they couldn't build fleet carriers fast enough, um, and they needed as many hulls uh, and to carry as many aircraft as they possibly could. There was also some thought of using them to support lesser operations, things like minor invasions, or perhaps to help screen the fleet while the bigger carriers did most of the heavy lifting in terms of strike offensives. Um, but the kind of their their use was a, a little bit muddled um, as outside of the massive single decisive strike that the main fleet carriers trained for Japanese air carrier doctrine um, hadn't advanced that much um, although obviously that massive uh, fleet strike doctrine was pretty advanced in and of itself but it was a bit of a, a one-trick pony once you worked out how to get away from the vast hordes of uh, aircraft bearing the symbol of the rising sun they didn't have that many other tricks in the box. Luchs asks, how do storms affect ships like hurricanes and such, and how do ships prepare to weather such a storm, either in the World War II era or the Age of Sail era? In the Age of Sail era, when you're talking about big storms like hurricanes, it's basically a case of pray to every single god you can possibly think of, then break out any book on board to see if there are any you've forgotten, and hope that somebody up there is looking down on you with favour because basically a wooden ship that's powered by wind in a hurricane is in a really, really, really bad position. Um, effectively, if you have your sails out, the wind is almost certainly going to snap the sails off, rip them off the mast if you're lucky, and if you're unlucky, tear the mast down with them. And if you don't have your sails up, then you're just going to be blown all over the place by the wind and probably end up broadside to a massive wave and sunk. So, Age of Sail era ships, their response to hurricanes was get out the way into harbour if at all possible. Um, otherwise, as I said, just basically pray for divine intervention and hope your crew is supremely lucky and, uh, and competent. When it comes to World War II ships, um, ships the size of battleships actually didn't have to worry too much about it. They would just basically tell everyone to stay away from being outside, lock all the doors down, plug all the turrets, um, all the guns on the turrets, I mean, and uh, 
ride it out. There's quite some fascinating footage of um, various battleships doing passable impressions of submarines and such in storms and accounts of even greater ones from various uh, naval sources including a storm in the North Sea that was so big it wasn't even a case of ships um, being sort of submerging their bows in the water uh, they describe entire battleships like the King George V actually sailing up the side of a wave cresting over the top uh, kind of like a surfer or a speedboat and then skidding all the way back down and when you consider that's a several hundred feet 35,000 ton battleship that's a heck of a wave um, Typhoon Cobra is a fairly good example of how World War II era ships handled massive storms like hurricanes and cyclones the answer to that being not very well if they weren't significant. I mean, US battleships that went through it came out relatively well. Um, the carriers as well kind of came out of it very well. They lost a lot of aircraft because aircraft are vulnerable to being thrown around and obviously being blown around. Um, the cruisers did take some damage. The destroyers had it quite bad with a number of them being sunk. Um, it basically just comes down to the fact that realistically, if you're in a really bad storm, Unless you happen to displace more than about 25,000, 30,000 tons, you just really don't want to be in the way of it. Curtis Boyer asks, does the Royal Navy still deploy Royal Marines on ships in a similar role to that they historically performed, i.e. keeping order, securing key areas, etc, etc? Well, with the press gang <laughs> no longer a thing, the Royal Navy doesn't have quite so many issues with its own crews. So the sort of keeping order and securing areas on the ship's role is not needed quite so much. Although given that if you do have a Royal Marine contingent on board, they're going to be the best armed and the best trained in terms of personal weapons. If you have any security issues on a Royal Navy ship, it it's usually the Royal Marines who get lumped with that duty if there are any on board. Otherwise, you just give a, a SA-80 to a sailor and hope for the best, although that didn't, doesn't always go quite to plan. Um, to be honest, Royal Marines these days most of the time are there for um, ship security and operations in more of an off-board manner, i.e. they're looking for outside threats and they're operating to... Um, capture things like drug runners, inspect ships, etc, that kind of stuff. Arm Raider asks, what are your thoughts on the Santissima Trinidad? Did the Spanish overdo it with the refit for 144 guns? Would it have been better to keep it at its normal complement of guns? The answer to that, yeah, they pretty much did overdo it a bit. Um, yes, it gave it a theoretical on paper ridiculous armament, but... With it being a refit and all the guns stuck on top, the guns themselves were relatively lightweight weapons, so they didn't contribute too much to a fight between first rates. And the records show that it made the ship very slow and quite lumbering, even for a first rate ship of the line. So they actually began to cut back on that um, effect quite quickly afterwards. Um, once it was complete, they realised it. They, they basically turned what was a very big very well armed fairly well protected first rate that could keep up with the fleet into something that more resembled a mobile building uh, with all the speed and maneuverability that that entails Luke's returns asking how did razade ships perform were they more effective than purpose-built frigates with larger guns like the endymion um, or did their hulls make up for it were they slower or similar speed as they're designed to be frigate brothers so, as we touched on in the USS Constitution video, the Razés performed very well. Um, basically, they they had the most of the firepower that they'd had as third rates. They had the hull strength and durability of a third rate ship of the line, um, but they were manoeuvring around with most of the speed and agility of a frigate. So they were pretty nasty opponents if anyone ever ran into them. And various iterations of Razés during um, the various uh, wars that Britain fought during the Age of Sail often had some of the best combat records. Their one disadvantage was uh, light and medium air speed. So a large frigate like the Endymion or indeed something like one of the American uh, Constitution, President, United States types, etc. 
those ships would be able to move faster in lighter and medium winds simply because the Razade ship would displace more and have a hull form that was more adept for agile manoeuvring and battle than it was necessarily for high speed running. Um, but where that advantage flipped over was in heavy uh, weather when the lighter hulls and rigging of a purpose-built frigate uh, would be at a disadvantage compared to the much heavier rig and sail of a X third rate and the fact that also um, third rates themselves weren't necessarily too slow and you were talking about a ship that hadn't actually lost any of its rigging but had lost significant amounts of mass so as the wind speed gets up into sort of the high medium and up into high winds the razes really come into their own because they can just bludgeon their way through most seas and keep sail up for a lot longer than their lighter weight cousins panzer Schiff asks naval tabletop war games i've mentioned them in previous videos um, what kind of game systems do you know of and do you have any recommendations for people who want to get started? Well, there's an awful lot of them. Um, it is one of the uh, slightly more popular tabletop board gaming formats once you get beyond the usual 28mm army format. Um, and they vary in scale from very, very sort of small scale um, engagements things like torpedo boats and destroyers and such like with a very few models all the way up to incredibly large scale games where you can buy packs that include like the entirety of both sides at the battle of jutland for a couple of hundred quid and each of those scales has multiple different rule sets so yeah, I know of an awful lot of them, and to, to list them all would probably require a full dry dock episode. Um, in terms of recommendations for what people uh, should use if they want to get started, and bear in mind, obviously, there is also a bunch of fantasy tabletop war games, um, like my, my one of my very favourites, Dystopian Wars, sadly currently out of production, hopefully back in production soon. Um, it basically comes down to how much how much knowledge does somebody have when they're getting into the game if you're working from a point of view of these ships look cool i want to fight with them on the tabletop you probably want to go for one of the very much simpler systems so um something that maybe is as I said is at that lower end of maybe involving things like destroyers and torpedo boats maybe cruisers something the way you can have a decent fight with maybe half a dozen ships max um with some fairly simple rules um, if you know what you're doing, then you can obviously get into some of the slightly bigger stuff that's more scalable. Um, to be honest, as long as it doesn't go full on like magic and stuff, the sort of the, the non-historical fantasy games can offer some fairly nice rule sets that can then be retrofitted back onto um, historical war games. If you know an awful lot and you really, really want to get stuck involved and involved and you're more interested in sort of how would this historical scenario actually have played out, then obviously you can go full, full, um, <laughs> full war gaming setup, but then you need loads and loads of people. I know I haven't recommended any particular games to, to start for people to start with, but as I say it basically depends on where you're coming from. Um, if you want to give me a theoretical, um, this person with this much experience and or interest in games and, uh, naval history um then i could probably narrow it down it to maybe two or three recommended starter games but if you want to do that well you already know where the discord is obviously so tell me there benton asks a fairly long and involved question about torpedo tubes on battleships specifically with reference to the nagato but also um whether they were carried on other warships what would they do etc etc so on battleships, torpedo tubes had a variety of placements. Some put them on standard launchers, um, kind of like destroyers and cruisers, although this was quite rare. Um, others had them sort of semi-concealed part way up the hull, and many, usually most, had submerged tubes under the water, so you can actually see them if you were just looking at the ship um, straight on in normal circumstances. As for how they were supposed to work, well, it was very much basically a holdover from the era when engagement ranges were expected to be a lot closer, escort forces played a lot less of a role, and it was thought that battleships might get into torpedo range of each other. Um, and given that battleship technology was advancing so rapidly all the time, 
Uh, there were semi-constant fears that escorts might be um, outcompeted again. Um, I mean, if you look at something like the Battle of Jutland, there were plenty of cruisers, um, there were plenty of destroyers, but ultimately battleships on both sides did end up getting into secondary battery range of each other, um, basically because cruisers and destroyers, at, at a certain point when you're talking about mass fleet engagements, just get pressed out of the way or or they die. And it is quite the nasty sting in the tail, especially when, if you're firing Hell for Leather at the enemy battleship, you can hope, at least, that you're distracting him enough that he may not notice a torpedo launch from a ship that is otherwise just throwing loads of shells at him, which are a little bit of a distraction. As for whether any other warships carried it, yep, um, right up until the Washington Naval Treaty, um, the, even the Nelson class were designed with underwater torpedo tubes, and yes, they were a bit of a problem with maintenance. Um, they were known to be weak points in ship's design because the torpedo room had to be quite large and was obviously full of explosives, so a hit in that area would be a lot worse than a hit to a normal underwater section of the ship. Um, the Nelson actually took a torpedo hit on Mediterranean convoy escort duty that flooded the torpedo room. That caused uh, a lot more flooding than uh, any other hit along the side would have. And uh, did they actually work? Well, they weren't really used that much. Rodney ostensibly did score a torpedo hit on the Bismarck, which I suppose is a success in a way, but let's face it, the, that probably didn't really change what was going to happen to the Bismarck all that much. Um, realistically speaking, they probably would have been better off scrapping the whole idea in the early 1910s and using the space for something else, but they that's with the benefit of hindsight. By the time World War II rolled around and the treaty battleships, no one was putting torpedo tubes on battleships anymore because they realised the range had gotten far, far too long um, for anybody to really bother with that idea. And finally for this week, the Great King asks, if the Russian Navy has the Kirov-class battlecruisers, could the American, British and Japanese navies have ships similar to them? The Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force, as it is currently called, um, definitely couldn't because they are restricted by treaty and, I believe, constitution to defensive um, technology only. So that's part of the reason why they're desperately pretending that their helicopter destroyers are helicopter destroyers and not actually baby carriers. Um, and something like a Kirov class... It is an offensive weapon, no way, shape, or uh, doubt about it. So they are not going to get away with building something like that anytime soon, um, just as much as they're not going to get away with building any actual true carriers anytime soon. For the Royal Navy, well, I'd like to see them come up with a budget for, for it, for one thing. Um, basically, the answer for the... Royal Navy and the United States Navy is pretty much the same thing, and it's just a diff completely different doctrine. Um, the Russians didn't have carriers, uh, really, of any real description right up till the end of the Soviet Union, and nowadays they've got, like, one that was breaking down and currently has a crane living on its flight deck. Um, so they were facing an enemy that put all their doctrine into surface shipping and carriers specifically so without a carrier of their own to counter it they needed some other way of um, matching them and they came up with a Kirov class which is basically when it comes down to it gigantic missile batteries um, kind of a slightly better implemented version of the arsenal ship concept to be honest but geared to sea strike and pretty well defended actually for for their size um whereas the americans definitely and the british to a slightly lesser degree just went well we've got carriers that's our long range striking power that's what we'll use to kill enemy fleets um and so there isn't really any need for them if they wanted to to do it then i guess they probably could um the main problem would be coming up with some kind of long-range naval attack surface-to-surface -surface missile um, because Harpoon's definitely not going to cut it in that kind of role. Uh, Navalized Tomahawk's been retired, etc. Maybe something like the Perseus program could be uh, worked up for the British. Um, for the Americans, 
well, the the U.S. Navy will probably fight tooth and nail. They'd rather, they'd much prefer a carrier because a carrier is a lot more useful. But if they were absolutely forced to, um, it look up the CGX project. It was um, it was supposed to be complement the DDG one thousand or project, um, and that kind of in a way begins to push a similar envelope, although on a smaller hull. Um, but concept-wise, that's probably about as close as the U.S. Navy would ever let themselves get um, without compromising their catch or carrier program. And as we're about to hit the 40-minute mark, I'm going to stop talking now. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Hope you appreciate and approve of the new intros, etc., and graphics. And I will see you again in the next video.